<laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our talk, Asterisk Chaps. Um, <laughs> a novel combination of prior work to crack MS, uh, crack MS Chap and MTL MV1, or why uh, MS Chap V2 doesn't cover its ass. Uh, I'm Mike Kruger, or I'm just underscore cable thief on Twitter. This is Dominic White, or Singe on Twitter. Um, today, I'm going to be discussing, well, I'll be taking you through uh, an MS Chap challenge response. I'll be taking you through why we can use hash lists rather than word lists for cracking these things, and also some ideas around that. Dominic is going to take over about halfway through, and he's going to take you through um, how he went in depth into the DES uh, <laughs> into into the DES cryptography on the, on the challenge response. He's going to talk about how he created a tool to do this a bit faster. And he's probably going to go down his optimizations and things that he did, took to get there. Anyway, switch over to these slides. Cool. So basically, the entire <laughs> the entire industry has been carrying on using uh, MS Chap or NTL MP1. So MS Chap Peep specifically because it's very very convenient for Wi-Fi. You don't have to set up um certificates and well you don't have to set up certificates for it to actually work but uh, you do need to set up certificates if you want it to be secure but so industry they keep using it we hackers keep saying uh this is definitely dead industry keeps going no it's definitely alive so to show you why it has problems and why we think it's technically dead or it should be uh, put the last bullet in it uh, let's go through the ms chap exchange so you can get a better idea of what tool we created and then sort of what optimizations dominic has has implemented so the ms chap challenge response the idea behind it is to transfer prove knowledge of a secret without transferring that secret over the wire so to do that, we're going to go through this example using King Arthur and a Frenchman from Monty Python's Holy Grail. So the user or client will come along, give his username. The authenticator, this in this instance, would be the access point we're wanting to get onto, will provide a challenge. This challenge uh, in the MS Chap world is a 16 byte or 16 octet uh, random string of uh, bytes. Um, at which point the Arthur will submit his own challenge to the Frenchman. This will be a also 16 random bytes and he will include an NT response. This NT response uh, is created by taking the challenge that the Frenchman gave him, the challenge that he has, putting it together and then taking the password that he has and encrypting that challenge so that it uh, generates this random string of bytes. He won't then submit it to the Frenchman. The Frenchman can then just inspect this. He now has, the Frenchman has the peer challenge. He can take this peer challenge, combine it with the challenge that he sent over, basically redo all the same operations. And if it matches the NT response, then he knows, okay, cool. Uh, Arthur has the same password I do, right? But MS Chap is a uh, synchronous uh, authentication uh, challenge response thing, whereby not only is Arthur authenticating to the Frenchman, it is the Frenchman also authenticating to Arthur. So the Frenchman, now that he has all this information, generates his own response, which is essentially all the the same info about all the information that's transferred till now, as well as some bit of the password, which he will then send back to Arthur after having um, prepended an S equals for success. However, if he fails, Arthur gets sent a big fat F and gets told to, to bugger off. Cool. So let's dive into this a bit deeper. We have the, <laughs> we have the challenge generation. Now, when I say challenge generation, 
I'm going to be talking about the challenge that is ultimately used in generating the NT response as well as the authenticator's response. So you'd think it was that 16 bytes that the, the Frenchman sent over. However, that is not the case. It is actually the username, the challenge provided by the Frenchman, and the challenge provided by Arthur. All these things are put together in a SHA, and then the first eight bytes are taken from that, and that is used in the equation for future hashing. Uh, this is important to know because uh, the way MS Chap cracks is the same way that uh, NTLMv1 cracks. However, NTLMv1 generates its challenge in a different way. So meanwhile, while both these things crack the same, um, they generate their challenges differently. Anyway, so from here on, the challenge is going to be this amalgamation of the two challenges as well as the username. All right. The thing that Arthur generates is he takes his password, he NT hashes it. NT hashing is basically just an MD4 sum. He then adds the, that to the challenge. Essentially, he encrypts the challenge using his NT hash. This generates the NT response, which is what he submits. So you can see he's encrypted the challenge with his NT hash. This gives the Frenchman the opportunity to encrypt the same challenge with the NT hash that he knows. And if it ends up in the same response, he knows that Arthur has the correct password. From the Frenchman's side, he does some slightly different work because otherwise he could just submit Arthur's challenge back to Arthur. Sorry, Arthur's response back to Arthur. And Arthur wouldn't, we wouldn't really get the, the desired result. So what the Frenchman will do is he'll take the password, he'll MD4 it into an NT hash, he'll MD4 it again into an NT hash hash, uh, in which case he'll add the username, he'll add some static magic that's in the RFC, so he'll sprinkle on a little bit of magic, he'll add in that same challenge, and then he will add in the NT response that Arthur provided him, and that is the response he submits. The SHA of all that is the response he submits to Arthur, if Arthur uh, was successful in authenticating. Right? So if we look at this a bit closely, especially at the NT response generation, you'll notice that what actually goes into the final um, NT response is not necessarily the password. We can skip the password stage and just use the NT hash. It's the same from the other side with the Frenchman. Uh, we have the password, we convert it into an NT hash, and then we start using the NT hash. So once again, we can skip that step if we have the NT hash. So I was sitting there thinking uh, <laughs> about this, and I thought, well, if we only need the NT hash, and we have sources of NT hashes, such as um, Active Directory, or things like Have I Been Pwned, can't I use that and sort of pass the hash to get onto um, wireless networks? Given them uh, passing the hash is essentially within the, within the challenge response. All we have to do is skip the first step. So empty hash and then pass the hash, All right? So I went researching, host APD and WPA supplicant both support this. You can see in these uh, example configs I've provided, uh, the main difference is you just prepend hash and colon, and then you give it the hash in both cases. So in the supplicant case, your password equals hash colon, and then in the EAP user file case for host APD at the bottom, uh, it's a case of where you would usually put the password, you just say hash colon. So now we can use hash lists instead of word lists. Uh, current, current MS chat modes take very long. Uh, there's a lot of wasted NT hashes if you only use cracked ones. And there are places you can go to get NT hashes. So the idea behind this was why, why bother cracking when we can get like word lists of actual passwords from somewhere and then just use them and pass the hash. And what really intrigued me was uh, Troy Hunt from Have I Been Pwned providing NT hashes. Right. This means we have a really large database of real-world passwords that it's possible people have chosen. 
as the Active Directory passwords. And should we capture an MS chat challenge response, we can use that as a word list to quickly check whether um, this person has reused a password. So I thought it would be very convenient. So I went looking on how I would go about cracking NT um, MS chat v2 using an NT hash. And I found uh, the Hashcat forums in uh, 2016, uh, two, um, two forum posts uh, where they break the uh, the challenge response into multiple NT hash segments, sorry, into multiple DES sections, and then they crack the DES section. So reading through these two form posts, what they do is they basically, given that the DES key is only eight, eight bytes long, they go through it and crack the entire DES key space to get back the NT hash. So I thought, ah, okay, cool. We don't even need to use hashless. We have a way of guaranteed getting back the, the user's NT hash. So I promptly put that into my little uh, MacBook, pressed enter to brute force the entire key space. And it said something like four years or something like that. So I went back to my idea of using hash lists. So I tried going through the whole rigmarole of setting up this multi-phase DES cracking where I split up my NT hashes into little sections and trying using those. However, this became a mission. So I thought, why not create new Hashcat modes? How difficult can it be? Essentially, all I'm going to be doing is taking mode 5500 and taking out one MD4, right? And then it basically it's perfect, right? So uh, last SenseCon, which is a internal hackathon, I got a team together and we built these new hash modes. So we built uh, 27,000 and 27,100, a one for a net NTL MV1, which can apply to MS Chap, and then one for net NTL MV2. Um, it wasn't as easy as I thought it would be with just removing one MD4, one MD4 sum, but uh, it now works and it should be in, in Hashcat. So now we have a way to provide just a long list of hashes, so a hash list rather than a word list. And then that uh, gets us, well, rivet, well, we can crack NT hashes, sorry, net NTLM v1 hashes with, uh, with hash lists. So we can use uh, Troy Hunt's Have I Been Porn database. Right, so let me just demo this to you. I have created my fancy new hash mode. We're going to take use the uh, example hash provided by Hashcat, now that's, now that's there. And we should see that we crack successfully uh, using an NT hash. Uh, and you'll notice at the end, uh, B4B9, that is a NTLM hash for the word Hashcat. Right? So brilliant. So now, considering that uh, I've taken away an operation, there should be a, a big speed increase, right? So I was all excited. We can see that my hash gets me uh, 6,000 kilohashes a second. If we compare that to the old mode that has an entire operation more, we get 22, well, 220 mega hashes, which is a lot faster, right? So why is this the case? Well, after some questions to the Hashcat people, uh, Hashcat has the uh, concept of amplifiers. So with the normal mode, we are essentially transferring over a word and then potentially applying a big bunch of rules to it, at which point we that word now on the GPU blows up into a few thousand uh, different words, right? If we think about what we're doing with my hash mode, we are taking a hash, transferring it to the GPU, checking it, and then we can't do any additional modifiers to it. So we throw it away and we go to the next hash and the next hash. So what happens is we get throttled by the bus to the GPU a lot more. And this adds a hell of a lot of overhead and makes it infinitely slower. Um, so to get around this, uh, Dominic is going to take over from this point forward. Right. So. Let me pass this over to Dominic now, 
and he can talk about his new approach uh, of how he sort of optimized and got around those optimization problems that I had. Right, over to you, Dominic. Thanks, Michael. Hello, everyone. Uh, okay, so Michael did all the hard work and talked a lot about arses. I'm going to do the easy work and talk, talk more about asses. So the, uh, what Michael showed you in the exchange is that at some point you've got this, this password hash, which is turned into an anti-response. And the way that's done in a little more detail is we take the password hash and we split it up into three keys. And then each of those keys is uh, used to, with the challenge separately in a separate cryptographic operation. So it's not like triple des where you, it's three des rounds. These are literally three separate single des rounds. The other thing that's interesting here is because there isn't enough uh, bytes in the password hash and a des key is seven bytes long, for the last key, they end up padding it with five, five bytes. So when each of those things are encrypted, we produce the, the NT anti response. Now, when we're cracking this, we're going the other way around. We've got the challenge and we've got the anti response and we're trying to get the password hash. And we know that there's these three DES operations. So we need to figure out these three keys. We've got the challenge and we've got the ciphertext that gets generated. Uh, so we're going to go in reverse. Now, the thing that pops out as kind of the most obvious is this key three, which has these two bytes that are, are padded. And what we can do with those is we can brute force the uh, brute force them because the key space for that is 65,535 only. Uh, DES operations are pretty efficient on modern hardware. That's not a lot of DES operations. And that's that's the maximum key space. So average time, you're going to find that in half that. So we can brute force those two bytes and then we'll get the last two bytes of the password hash. And then we just need to recover the other two keys at this point. Now, that's not a new observation. This is a slide from Joshua Wright's deck at uh, DEF CON 11 at Alexis Park in 2003. And you can see in the middle of the slide there, he's got weak DES key selection, permits recovery of two bytes of the anti hash. So we've known this for, for a long time. And uh, later on, when Moxie Marlin Spike and David Hulton at uh, DC20 in 2012 presented their work, they, they used this, but they took it one step further, another optimization. And that was instead of going through the DES key space twice, brute forcing the, the two keys, they go through the DES key space once because they do one cryptographic operation and two compare operations. So we're looking for this key, uh, these two different keys. So we can perform this cryptographic operation and then go, does it match either of the keys? So that was another optimization they came up with in, in 2012. Uh, and if we look at the history of the speed here, so the, the other work that Moxie and David Hulton did was they introduced FPGAs, but it's useful to understand the history um, to, to understand the future. So in 1998, the EFF produced these custom chips, ASICs, uh, and at, a, at an exorbitant cost of $250,000. And that could brute force all of the DES key space uh, within 227 hours. And you can see the keys per second on the right there. Now, what's interesting is if you look going forward from 1998 to 2020, there isn't massive jumps in, in key, uh, the number of keys per second. Well, there is a, a big jump between 2006 and 2012. But then after that, it actually goes backwards before we go forwards. What there is a big change in is price between 1998 and 2006. So the $250,000 to $10,000 is, is a big difference. And that was because FPGAs allow us to effectively create custom programmable chip pathways without needing to design custom chips. Uh, and so in 2006, the Copacabana team did that with an FPGA. It actually took longer, but at only $10,000, big improvement. Then what Moxie and uh, Dave did in 2012, was they also used FPGAs, but with their optimizations, they were able to reduce the, uh, the time down to 23 hours, as well as a dramatic speed improvement using their, their FPGA approach. And they built Cloudcracker, if, if some of you remember that. But then by 2016, Hashcat was starting to catch up here. So uh, here I've used 32 RTX 980s as an example with the, what they would have cost at the time in that speed. And the reason I've used 32 of them is because that gives us a comparable cost to the 2006 Copacabana team. And so of course you could use more or less. And then in 2020, 
uh, using um, chick some Chicken Man's stats for the GTX 3080s, we're still sitting around 10,000 or actually 11,000, but we've now managed to get to speeds that the FPGAs were doing in 2012. What you should take from all of this though, is it's slow, it all requires DES brute forcing and it's slow. So what that means is you're guaranteed to get a response, but uh, it's not necessarily well optimized. So we can improve on that pretty dramatically uh, with Asslus, and that's that's what we did. So MS Chap version two and NTLM version one doesn't protect its ass because you've got these two bytes that you can brute force really easily. Now this is known; it's been used by others uh, in Hashcat, for example. It does an early discard that if the last two bytes don't match of the hash, it doesn't uh, doesn't send them through. What I did is is something different, and it's it's really nothing more interesting than reducing the hash list up front. Uh, by looking for the two two bytes. So here's an example graph saying, show me all the empty hashes from an empty hash list, like the have I been pwned list that Michael spoke about, that match those last two bytes. So if we take that the hashcat example, instead of doing an early discard in hashcat's code, what I'm doing is just sending a reduced list to hashcat in the first place. And when I did that as an initial POC, what I saw is that hashcat was running around eight seconds and my crappy POC was under a second. Uh, so there's two sample hashes with two word lists, a small word list and the have I been pwned word list. And we were going from two, two and a half minutes, well, actually nearly three minutes, sorry, to 46 seconds uh, or a minute to 41 seconds or 10 seconds to under a second. Now that's not amazing, but it's enough to tingle my spidey senses and tell me there's something there. So like Sir Robin, I bravely went forth and uh, traveled down this dark path. And this dark path is the dark path of performance optimization. If any of you have ever gotten stuck in this, it can be quite rewarding, but there's a lot of uh, misleading pathways it can take you down. So the first thing is I did uh, I'll ch simplistically is instead of using grep, I used rip grep. Any of you familiar with rip grep, it's quite a lot faster for big files than normal grep written in Rust and it's got a bunch of other optimizations. That got me a bunch of extra speed. And then I simplistically started operating on the hashes that were returned from ripgrep as they were returned rather than waiting for the whole command to finish before working on them. Things like that started giving me a bit of a speed up. And more importantly, I started building a, a Python POC. I then worked out that uh, there were two sets of optimizations we could do on the lookup of the last two bytes. So instead of brute forcing through the key space of 65,535, I did a frequency analysis and noticed that some sets of two bytes were more common than others in an otherwise randomized set. Outside of that, some passwords are more common than others. So something like password one is going to be more common than uh, a password manager generated password. And the last two bytes in password one then within a frequency set go up. So using a combination of a frequency sorted list, so where I didn't unique the, the passwords, as well as... Uh, a bunch of two bytes, it gave me a pretty decent lookup. That's actually in the GitHub repository for this if you want it. I later removed this, so that gave me a pretty decent speed up uh, with Python and the, and the DES operations. Uh, it didn't give me a, a speed up use when I eventually moved to what I'll get to in a bit. Then I started doing a bunch of file tricks. So can I, uh, can I seek from different places in the file? Can I reduce the file size so that I've got less to seek through? And what I realized was I was actually just doing the same kind of stuff databases already do just really badly. So at that point, I moved to a database. I first tried MariahDB, and it was much slower. I then tried SQLite, and it was even slower. But I, I sort of scratched my head at this because you know, databases should be able to handle millions of lines quite easily until a developer friend pointed out that uh, actually indexes are the things that make databases fast, not uh, just using a database. So putting indexes on uh, on my hash lookups managed to improve things quite dramatically. So you can imagine I'm searching for hashes that have these two bytes. So I can index the two bytes uh, that are put into a database. And that gives me pretty efficient lookup. It uses binary trees, balanced trees, uh, which gives you a big, in big O notation log n performance, which is important for in a moment. And then I built it in Rust. Rust obviously being compiled, it's faster than Python or janky bash script. Uh, and Rust also just sort of encourages good programming habits that make your, your stuff go a bit faster. I then tried a bunch of threading, threading things, which 
which have been quite misleading. For the most part, they either gave me the same performance as not using them or worse performance, or in some cases, very slight performance improvements. So I'm actually only using threading at this point for the two bytes lookup uh, with a couple of threads, which gives me a slight speed optimization on average, but threading wasn't, wasn't more efficient, which is very different from the FPGA type stuff. And it's really just because so few operations are happening. So let's get into things that look like I know what I'm talking about. So if we were to map the performance, the comparative performance of uh, the DES brute force, so going through the, the key space of DES, versus the approach we're taking in Asslus. So in Asslus, we, we do the lookup, uh, which is a, a B tree lookup. And then for the returned hashes, we need to crack the remaining keys. So there are some DES operations. Now, if we assume the lookup and the DES operations are the same, we can kind of plot some, some big O notation on a graph. So I've got two, two axes there. The Y axis is the number of operations and the X axis, axis is the number of hashes. So how many hashes do we get per number of operations? Both of those scales are logarithmic scales. So a straight line is actually a, uh, a curve, a logarithmic curve. And what you'll see at some point they cross over. So the blue line is a des brute force and the red line is, is the assless approach. And the point at which they cross over for worst case performance is about 4.3 billion hashes. So what that means is if you have an assless database that has 4.3 billion hashes in it, uh, then a DES operation, and assuming worst case performance, so the hash isn't, uh, is, is at the end and you have to look up everything, then a, a DES brute force would be the same. For the median case, that turns into 17 billion hashes. Uh, so that's that's pretty big. So if you think about the have I been pwned list, that's about 600 million hashes. So 17 billion or even 4.3 billion for the worst case is, is pretty significant. Uh, but if you're going bigger than that, it's worth uh, worth recognizing that, that DES is going to be, a DES brute force is going to be better. Plus a DES brute force is guaranteed to give you a hash. So for computer hashes or non-readable uh, hashes, that's a better approach. But if you're looking for human readable hashes, you know, the kind of things a user's actually chosen, then Asslus is going to have a, an obvious advantage because it's going to favor those over a random walk through, through DES key space. All right, so this is the, the money shot here uh, on, my, on my, my now old laptop. We need to rerun the benchmarks on the, the Mac M1. Uh, using three different hashes. So hash three was not present in, uh, in any of those word lists. And then there's three word lists, a small private word list, uh, the RockU database, obviously, and then the Have I Been Pwned database. So the bottom right shows worst case performance. So that's a hash that wasn't found. So we effectively had to go through all of the Have I Been Pwned database to get there. And you can see worst case performance was sitting at 63 milliseconds. Uh, best case performance was sitting at 11 milliseconds. And the median case is sort of 15, 19. Um, oh, I've got it written down there, 13 milliseconds. I should read my own slides. Now, if you think about the Rip Van Winkle slide and you think about how we were measuring the performance in hours, this is a massive improvement at the cost of not getting a guaranteed result. So the hash has to be in your hash database. But if you're doing a really quick look, if, uh, that gives you an immediate result that at least tells you, okay, now it's worthwhile to engage in a, in a DES key space brute force, then, uh, then great. All right, so this is available right now on the, um, our GitHub, github.com slash sensepost slash assless dash chaps. Uh, and I'm going to give you a quick demo on that. Okay, so now we've switched over to the demo. And the first thing we need is a word list, or more importantly, a hash list. So if we look at RockU, we've got clear text passwords. So we're going to need to convert that into the, the assless database format. It's a SQL-like database already created one here. If you look inside of it, what it has are empty hashes split up into the, the three key components. So here I'm just looking at the top five from here. A little bit later, I'll show you how to generate this hash list. Okay, so now that we, we've got our database, what we need is a hash. So if we look here, I've got an example hash We've captured from a user called Sally. It's got the NT response and it's got the challenge. We look at Asslus Chaps, we give it the challenge, then we give it the response, and then we give it the database. So here we're using rockyou.db. When we run it, we get our response very quickly. If we run it with time, you can see it took 0 0.015 seconds in total, which is pretty cool. 
Okay, now if we were to compare it with Hashcat's 5500 mode, which gives us the clear text using a clear text password list. Uh, I'm using the same hash, and I'm going to make it quiet, disable the pot file. Then let's, uh, I'm using some uh, Apple Silicon, I need to say D2. When I run it, I'm able to get the password. If we now run that with a timer, you can see that takes 1.166 seconds in total. Uh, so that's a hundred times speed difference almost between the two. Okay, so switching back to the slides from our demo, the next optimization we wanted to talk about is when you're looking at the Have I Been Pwned list, you've got a lot of passwords in there that typically aren't chosen by corporate Active Directory domain users. And when you're cracking an MS chat hash from a Wi-Fi exchange, that's probably from a Microsoft Active Directory um, controlled Wi-Fi network, which means the user's going to be using something that needs an uppercase, a lowercase, and a number in it, like the password one is capital P. But Have I Been Pwned has got things like one, two, three, four, five, six, and Michael or lowercase, stupid name if you ask me. Uh, and, and those sorts of things. Here's some stats from the NSCS, NSC, <laughs> NCSC, yeah, so just late night dyslexia here, uh, about what's what's in there. So this is not a great hash list for, for corporate passwords. What is a good hash list, uh, well, produces good hash lists is Hashcat's rules-based attacks. So I thought it would be really nice if we could use Hashcat's rule-based attacks to generate assless databases. Uh, so this is what Hashcat does with you know, an overly simplistic view of what Hashcat does with rules. If you take a, a password list that has password and the company name in it, and it's got three simple rules of adding numbers, adding dates, and changing the case, then you can get the, the, the kind of clear text examples you get on the right. So I've built some Hashcat, uh, well, a very simple modification to one of the Hashcat kernels to effectively generate CSV files for you that have the hashes in, that can then be consumed by the database creation utility in Aslis, as well as you can then use the normal Hashcat functionality to pass rules. So I'm going to give you a quick demo of that. This is all available on the GitHub repository. Okay, so we're going to give you the, the demo of generating hash lists. If we look at our RockU clear text database, uh, we've got clear text passwords in there. We need to turn that into, into a hash list. So there's two ways we can do that. The one is to convert it directly into a hash list using a Python program that's uh, included within Aslis, and that's what I'm going to show you first. And then the second is to expand it using the rules from, from Hashcat. Okay, so NT hash from clear just takes the database and spits out hashes. So I'm not going to do all of them. I'm just going to do the head. You can see it puts it in this special format with the first, uh, the last two bytes in the beginning, and then the uh, first seven bytes, and then the second seven bytes. So that is the the format the CSV file needs to be in to uh, be imported into the SQLite database. All right, next I'll show you how you can use Hashcat, and the reason I'd want to use Hashcat to do this is because then I can get uh, rules to increase the number of passwords that are generated. I'm giving it an impossible to crack hash so that it, it doesn't match the hash and then exit early. And I've applied the modifications from the Aslis repository on the um, 1000 mode. So you can see the dash R is the rule file for the best 64 rule, which just comes with Hashcat. You can use whatever rule you like. And then we can output that to the CSV file. It can take some time. So uh, instead, I'm just going to use the CSV file we generated before for the purposes of this demo. If you look at it, there's our there's our hashes. It's the full rock you. It's just the, the top of it. So there's another file included in the Aslis repository called make SQLite DB. You give it the name of the database you want to create. You give it the CSV file. It'll first import all of those into the, the, um, the SQLite database. After it's finished importing them, it will create the, the index on it. For something like rock you, that can take a couple of minutes. Uh, for something like Have I Been Pwned, that can take tens of minutes. So it depends on the, the size thing. But it's a once-off cost. Once you've got it, you're done. And then it in, the, the database with the index increases the size by about 63%. So the RockUDB is about 63% bigger than RockU.txt, which is worth bearing in mind, but it's really not massive, massive hash requirements at this point.
So there's one more thing that I want to show you, which is uh, if you've got an NTLM SSP or NTLM ESS hash. Here's an example of one taken from the Hashcat example hashes. And what you'll see is when I put what looks like the challenge and response into Atlas, uh, it just hangs. I haven't managed to track down this, this bug yet. But if you ever have Atlas just hanging like this, uh, it means you've got a, an SSP hash. So EvilMog has some scripts to, to fix that up. I found them quite complicated, so I've just written something very simple. It's called NTLM SSP. And you give it the, the LM part, and you give it the, uh, the challenge part from the SSP hash. It'll spit out the server challenge, which is what you can then use as the challenge to pass to, to Atlas. So it's a small conversion step that you need to do for NTLM version 1 ESS or, or SSP hashes. Uh, I'm not going to go into to all of the specifics there, but it's worthwhile noting if you're dealing with uh, NTLM version 1. So you can see I first tried it with Rocky, it wasn't in there, so then I tried it with Have I Been Pwned. Okay, so that was uh, demoing the hashless creation, and that's how you can create your own databases for, for use with Atlas. That brings me to the end of my section, and just a quick recap. Really what I was showing is how, because uh, MS Chap and NTLM version 1 don't protect their ass, that you can do this easy brute force of the last two bytes. You can use that to reduce the number of hashes you look at in the first place, and the way you can very efficiently reduce those number of hashes is using a database lookup with some, some com compiled code. And doing that has produced uh, a utility which improves the state of the art with, with this cracking. It's important to, to uh, mention that this also works for NTLM version 1 or NTLM version 1 SSP. There's a utility in the GitHub repository if you want to convert an SSP hash. Uh, so if you've got an NTLM version 1 hash, like something from Petty Potem maybe, still need to look into that, then uh, you might be able to recover it quite quickly using Ashless. Uh, Ashless. And on that note, I'm going to hand back to Michael. Cool. Thank you, Dominic. All right. So just to recap everything, everything, uh, why are we doing this? We want to recover NT hashes quickly. As I showed you, with an NT hash, you can pass the hash. Um, we can then pass the hash to connect to Wi-Fi. We can pass the hash to connect to VPNs. Um, you can use pass the hash on uh, normal Windows networks as well. Uh, the last one is also to host access points that hopefully you can trick people into connecting to you uh, so that you can do sort of person in the middle attacks and attack them further, as it were. Okay. So in summary, MSChapv2 use the nt-hash, not the clear text password. You can use full nt-hash lists, including the uncracked ones. Uh, new hashcat modes uh, we created with 27,100 27, for NTLMv1 and NTLMv2. NTLMv1, of course, being the same way you crack MSChap. MSChap exposes his ass, easy brute of the last two bytes. These can reduce the hash list to crack against, so it makes it very, very quick. Uh, index DB lookups cost less than Des brute forces, uh, at least at less than 17 billion hashes on the average case. So, people to thank uh, my hackathon team from uh, Orange Cyber Defense. This is the people who helped me create the initial uh, proof of concept for the Hashcat module. Uh, once we, once I had the Hashcat module in a pull request. Atom and Chicken Man gave me a lot of uh, help making it an actual good Hashcat module. Uh, we then want to thank Joshua Wright for asleep. Um, basically, all work is built off the shoulders of giants sort of thing. Moxie and David for cloud crack. And then if you are interested in this sort of technique of um, cracking hashes but skipping some steps in the front, uh, Chicken Man did a talk at DEF CON for hash shucking, which is the name of this technique. And then once again, you can get the uh, assless chaps from the repo listed. The end. And uh, cool, thank you.
Dominic? Adieu, adieu. Repeat you, adieu. Oh no, I should put my head in there.